Well, this morning I want to do something a little different. We've been in Romans and we're going to finish up Romans, but I wanted to pause it being Father's Day to talk on something that I think is exceptionally important. I don't do it every year, but uh, certainly it's on my heart. And that is I want to talk to dads. I know as I say that, that there are some who say, well, I'm not a dad. Maybe if you're a man, you will be. Or it's possible that you are a parent and a single parent at that. It certainly applies to parenting in general. And you have parents or you're, you know people who are parents, so the message certainly is very, very applicable and the topic very, very important. I want to speak on the influence of a godly dad. Part of the reason why a message like this is so critically important is because we live in a society that increasingly devalues masculinity and manhood. It would not be an exaggeration to say that manhood is under attack and is certainly being redefined. Turn on any sitcom and men are portrayed as immature boys. And fathers often are betrayed as beer gut buffoons. The fact of the matter is manhood matters and masculinity makes a difference. Let me share with you these stats. 63% of youth suicides are from fatherless homes. 90% of all runaway children are from fatherless homes. 85% of all children with behavioral disorders are from fatherless homes. 71% of high school dropouts are from fatherless homes. 75% of all adolescent chemical abuse patients in drug treatment centers are from fatherless homes. 85% of all youths in prison are from fatherless homes. These results are not only shocking, but I would say on the other hand, they're maybe not surprising. They're about as politically incorrect as it is possible to be, but they confirm what criminologists, psychologists, educators, and evangelical Christians know. And it's this, that a father's influence is out of proportion when compared to his mocked and diminished role in Western society. Now, let me just say this so everybody's on the same page. The mother's role is very, very important. It is not a matter of one is more important than the other. What it is a matter of is that God has designed the roles to serve in a complementary fashion and together to reflect the nature and the person and the heart of God in a way that neither role on their own can. The mother's role will always be primary in terms of intimacy, care, and nurture. But the fact of the matter is that as a child matures, he or she will increasingly look to the father for their role model in processing decisions and adopting values. This is, this is a fact that statistically can be proved. And where the father is indifferent, inadequate, or just plain absent. The task of maturing in a responsible manner becomes much harder for the child. And the stakes spiritually could hardly be higher. According to data collected by Promise Keepers and Baptist Press, corroborated with a European study as well, done in Switzerland, and a study done by the Lutheran Church, if a father does not go to church, even if his wife does, only one child in 50 will become a regular worshiper. The, the best number I can find in studies is 18%. Now, maybe you're a single mom and you're saying, well, where does that leave me? 
Can I just encourage you today that God delights in doing exceptional things in the life of people who believe in him? You believe him to be that exception. You believe that you're gonna, God's going to help you to be the exception to the rule in your situation. That you as a godly mother, when you're left there, God is going to help you to do what needs to be done. So the goal of that statistic is not to dishearten anyone, but you yourself could give testimony to the fact it's difficult if you're doing it on your own. Statistics say this, where the father regularly attends church, even if the mother does not, 66% of the children will attend church. When both husband and wife attend church, 75% of the children will become regular attenders. All of that to say this, we are not talking luxuries here, we're talking necessities. We need a generation of godly men who understand the importance of being an influential godly father. Because the fact of the matter is, you can produce a family and that does not make you a father. You can be married, but that does not make you a mate. And you can be a male, but that does not make you a man. And I wanna say this, especially to dads today, the way we live our life, the way we lead in our homes will have effect on our children, will have an effect on our marriage, will have an effect on our lives, and as we're gonna see, will affect the generations. That's why what we're talking about this morning is so very, very important. What I'm going to do, because to talk about all the dynamics of fatherhood and what makes a difference, um, would be daunting to do in just a brief message. Some of you are thinking none of your messages are briefs, John, so come on, I mean, <laughs> brief to me maybe. I mean, I'm gonna talk to you about the Word of God because I believe that's the basis and the foundation for all of life and certainly for parenting. My concern is that as I talk about the Word of God and, and the force with which I'm going to talk about the Father's responsibility relative to the Word of God is that if I don't balance it with some of the other things that need to be said and should be said, uh, the end result might not be favorable for the children or for the home. What I, mean by is this, what I mean by that is this, that if a father takes this message on the Word of God but implements it in a dictatorial, high-handed, unkind, unwise manner without operating in humility, it's not gonna help. All of what I'm saying has to be applied in wisdom. But let me just suggest that there are two other things that I won't talk much about other than here at the start that I think must be a part of the discussion of, of godly influential parenting. First of all would be that of having relationship with your children. You have to have relationship. Here's the mistake a lot of parents make. They have the idea that, that somehow love equals influence. That's just simply not true. I know a lot of parents who love their children incredibly and have very little influence with them. The formula is more like this, love plus time equals relationship. You cannot have relationship, influential relationship, unless you're spending time with your kids. The mistake that a father especially can make is to somehow see the, the younger years as the domain of the mother's responsibility. So the dad only wants to be with the children when the children can share in a hobby or an interest of the dad. The dad only wants to be with the children when the children are able to engage the dad in, in conversation that he feels comfortable uh, with or enjoys having. 
The fact of the matter is that a relationship with your children starts when they're young, starts with spending time with them when they're young, taking them when they're little, doing that, that you're investing relationally in them because your children are looking up to you. Will you make the most of that and take advantage of them looking up to you by, by being relational with them regardless of their age or their ability to interact based on your interest? You're, you're the parent. It's not their job to enter your world, it's your job to enter their world. That's the first thing. The second thing is that all of, all of parenting has to be done in humility. It has to be done in a way where we recognize our responsibility as parents and as fathers to humbly accept the fact in front of them and acknowledge that we're not perfect. The way it would play is this, that as you're calling your family or as you're calling your children to live the Word of God, there's going to be times when you're going to fall beneath the standard of the Word of God. How you respond in that moment, what you do in that moment, is critical as to whether you're going to have influence with your children. So for example, and and you can imagine that as a pastor where your children are watching you preach, that they're also watching you live, and they are certainly aware of those moments where the two don't match. How we handle that, that we acknowledge it, that we don't ignore it, that we don't just move on and act like it doesn't matter is critical in that moment. So the way my play is, it could be, and and all of this certainly is done in an age-appropriate manner, but even when they're small, don't assume that you don't owe an apology or an acknowledgement. So it might work like this. Hey, guys, I want to talk to you. I I didn't talk to your mother right there. I just want to say, you know, I I, I didn't answer her right, and I, I love her, and I'm committed to her, and... I'm asking you to forgive me because I wasn't, I wasn't a good example for you, but I wasn't right to her. And if Debbie's there, then I say, Debbie, will you forgive me? But usually I've taken care of that, but then I would say to the kids, and I want to ask, will you forgive me? And then I wait until they respond because I think it's really important that we don't just say, I'm sorry, but that we, we for a moment engage them in a way that involves a response on their part, a release, if you will, of forgiveness that allows us to move forward relationally and the path is cleared. If you don't do that, your children will eventually view you as a hypocrite and they will turn you off. That being said, I, I want to talk to you about being a godly father, especially from the standpoint of being a passionate lover of God and his word. And I want to do it from Deuteronomy chapter 6. Deuteronomy chapter 6. I'm going to give you three primary points, a few sub-points along the way. First of all, I want you to see a godly father leaves a legacy. He leaves a legacy that it's important for you and I to understand that how we live today not only affects today and tomorrow and not only affects the the next few months, but how you and I live has a generational effect. What we do today, the way you and I serve God today will echo through the decades and if the Lord tarries through the centuries. The dads, you're leaving a legacy. You're shaping the family line, the family tree, the family legacy for generations to come. You may have come from a background where you, where you say, I never had that, and you then are star- starting a legacy of godliness, a heritage of blessing. When you come to Deuteronomy chapter 6, Moses is at the end of his life. And what Moses is doing is after having led the nation of Israel through the desert for 40 years, Moses now is reminding the people of the last 40 years and how God has brought them through this point. 
and he rehearses for them what God has done and he reminds them about the giving of the law and the priority of, of the law and their obedience, their attention to the law. In Deuteronomy, I think it's chapter 5 and verse 22, he, he, he says, remember that you, of all the peoples of the earth, you heard the voice of God. The, the only time in the history of mankind, 200 or 2 million people heard God speak audibly to them. You say, oh, that would be so cool. I would love to have that happen. Well, here was their take on it. After that happened, the people went to Moses and they said, don't ever let that happen again. That was so terrifying. If it happens again, because in that moment, hearing the voice of God unfiltered, the holiness of God, the righteousness of God, the power of God made them think they were gonna die. They said, if that happens ever again, we're probably all gonna, gonna die, so go tell God, hey, talk to Moses, don't talk to us, and then Moses, you tell us what he says. Here's God's, God's take on that. Look at it. Deuteronomy chapter 5, verse 29. Oh, that they would always have hearts like this, that they might fear me and obey all my commands. If they did, they and their descendants would, watch this, prosper forever. Yeah. Do, do you see that? That if you and I have a heart for God, and you have, if you and I have a heart to obey, there is a generational effect. It doesn't just, certainly it affects me because God will bless me, but it affects my kids. It affects my grandkids. If the Lord tarries, it affects generations. And it doesn't affect them negatively. It affects them positively. They're going to prosper. I'm reminded because Joshua, and this is going to happen just, you know, within months of this, Joshua chapter 1, the Lord says to Joshua, this book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do according to all that is written in it. So get the word of God in you, think about it, obey it, watch what happens. For then you will make your way prosperous. Then you will have good success. God says, if you'll honor me, you'll honor my word, what's going to happen is I'm going to bless you in a way that's going to make you prosperous, in a way that's going to make you successful. Dads, there's a legacy that you can leave your children it's more powerful, it's more important, it's more valuable than stocks or bonds or a family business. So good. It's the legacy of knowing God, loving God, and living for God. Now let's look at it, Deuteronomy chapter 6. Now this is the commandment, the statutes and the rules that the Lord your God commanded me to teach you that you may do them in the land which you are going over to possess it. In other words, not that you just visit the blessing of the Lord, but you'd live in the possessing of the Lord. Not that you just hear about the blessing of the Lord, but you'd actually hold it, you'd touch it, you'd feel it. It would be, it would be what you dwell in. It would be what you'd be surrounded by. There, there's a bit of a permanence to it that you might fear the Lord your God and your son and your son's son. Do you see this? It's a generational thing. God cares about the generations. He cares about you, but God being the eternal God understands how quickly a life passes and God cares about the generations. God cares about extending blessing to the generations of those who love him and fear him and keep his commands. God delights in doing that. By keeping all his statutes and his commandments, which I command you all the days of your life, and that your days may be long. So do you see it again? If I keep it, then my son, my son's sons, do you get the idea? If whatever I do affects the following generations. Hear therefore, O Israel, and be careful to do them, that it may go well with you, that you may multiply greatly as the Lord, the God of your fathers, has promised you in a land flowing with milk and honey. Now, three things I want you to notice about this legacy. Number one, that you'd enjoy long life. Scripture says this over and over again. It says in Proverbs chapter 9 and verses 10 and 11, wisdom will multiply your days and add years to your life. What happens is when you're living a godly life and you're living in a godly way, 
You make the kind of decisions that lead, by and large, to longevity. Yeah. Yeah. Proverbs chapter 22 and verse 4 says, true humility and the fear of the Lord, watch this, very, very interesting, leads to riches, honor, and long life. Solomon says, I'm watching something and I'm noticing there are some things that commonly happen to people who love the Lord. God elevates them and honors them because God honors those who honor him. I also notice that they, they seem to do well financially. They do better than people who don't. And they seem to live longer. You say, well, that's all Old Testament. Well, in the New Testament, Ephesians chapter 6 says, you'll have a long life on the earth. Listen, your love for God, your living for him, your modeling godly wisdom can give your children a legacy of long life. Notice, secondly, it says that it might go well with you. Deuteronomy chapter 6, it says that it might go well with you, that things might go good for you. The message puts it this way. You'll have a good life, a life of abundance and bounty. That, that when a person honors the Lord, just like God said to Joshua, if you meditate on these words, you keep these words, you live in these words, what happens is you're going to be successful and prosperous. Do you see this? This is something that is all over Scripture. Can I just tell you, it pay you to read the Word of God every day? I don't think most people think of it that way. You say, well, should I just do it to try to get rich? I'm just saying, it's one of the motivators God gives. Don't ask me. I mean, take the word of God. Will, will the word of God, will reading it benefit you financially? Yes. If you live it, yes. Yeah, that's right. that's good. Will it benefit you relationally? Yep. If you live it, yes. Yeah, so will it benefit you in your standing in the community, the opportunity, if you live it, Yes. That, I mean, in that sense, it's a really wonderful thing. All the other things, I mean, we could talk all day about all it will do in your life internally. I'm just simply saying it will go well with you and it will go well with generations. As I'm reading the Bible, I'm literally investing in my kids and my grandkids' future. I'm thankful I'm sitting here looking at Debbie's mom and dad. These are people of the word, and a lot of what Debbie and I experience is a result of them loving the word, living the word, impressing on our hearts the word. Thank you. It's true. As you're doing it, it makes a difference. Third, that you might increase greatly in a wonderful land. Deuteronomy chapter 6, it says that you might multiply greatly as the Lord, the God of your fathers, has promised you in a land flowing with milk and honey. Not only will you be blessed, but the land, your surroundings will be blessed because here's the way it works. When a person is blessed by the Lord, there's like a spillover blessing that falls on people around them. When a person's blessed by the Lord, what happens is they, they, they live a life that expands their territory. Territory. I mean, it's just, it's, there's a spillover blessing. Dads, what, what kind of legacy are you leaving your children? I mean, do you realize the, the, the service that you give to the Lord? And let me just say this. Dads, thank you for being here today. I don't know where you're at in your spiritual journey. Thank you, though. You made a great choice. You, you might be new to this. You might be barely interested in this. You might be full on in this. But your being here is huge. It makes a massive difference in your children's lives. I think it says a lot about the church because, honestly, Father's Day is statistically the lowest attended day of the church calendar more than Memorial Day and Labor Day. I read that stat this weekend and I was shocked in my preparation when I came across that yesterday. I was like, well, that's not true of James River, which is a credit to what God is doing in this place. Men, thank you for what you're doing. But here's, here's the facts. Your obedience to the Lord or your lack of obedience determines what your children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren will know of God's working in their life. You're either 
creating a legacy for them, a blessing, or you are laying the groundwork for a life of hardship. Because what you do has a huge effect on them. Jonathan Edwards, who was a preacher in the first great awakening, he preached that masterful sermon, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God, and it shook New England. He was a godly man, a righteous man. A study was made concerning what happened to his descendants. Listen to this. More than 400 of them have been traced, and they include 14 college presidents, 100 professors, 100 of them have been ministers of the gospel, missionaries, and theological teachers. More than 100 of them were lawyers and judges. Out of the whole number, 60 have been doctors, and as many more authors of high rank or editors of journals. In fact, almost every conspicuous American industry has had as its promoters, one or more of the offspring of the Edwards descendants since the remote ancestor was married in the closing half of the 17th century. Fact of the matter is, listen, you're, you're, you're laying the groundwork for a godly legacy. Number two, a godly father not only leaves a legacy, but he leaves, he loves God intensely. Now look at it in Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verse 5. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. In order to train up godly children, they have to see a parent or parents preferably who are completely, totally in love with God. Parents who lead from within who aren't asking their children to do things they don't do, who aren't saying to their kids, I do these things when in fact they don't. So Moses, Moses gives some instructions here on what it means to love God. First of all, he says, we're to love God with a sincere love. Look at it in verse five. With all your heart. I mean, a sincere heart. The fact of the matter is, listen, our kids know we aren't perfect. They don't want to know that you're perfect. They already know you're not. What they do want to know is that you're sincere. What they do want to know is that it really matters to you, that you're really trying, that you're not playing games. What's really helpful for children to see in any parent, but dads, what, what I think you have to work harder at displaying because frankly, I think women are by and large, you know, you've heard of that sixth sense. Women are naturally more spiritually attuned, all things being equal. Think they have an easier time. You say, well, this is, you know, forget the political correctness. I'm just telling you my observation. And it appears to me that women have an easier time hearing from God by and large. Yeah. They're less worried about talking openly about their love for God. Society has somehow tried to make men feel that that's a woman's thing. When in fact there's, there, there's, for both men and women to be full on for God is the big issue. But men, what, what your children need to see is that you are passionately, enthusiastically, wholeheartedly in love with God. That you love him more than anything else or any, anyone else. That you are committed to him sincerely with all of your heart. That's a sincere love. Also a selfless love. Look at this. And with all your soul. That's the part people see. Your, your self is given over to God. And, and so it's obvious in what you do. It's obvious in where you spend your time. It's obvious on your calendar. It's obvious in your checkbook. It's obvious in your speech. It's just obvious that, that loving God and serving God is a really big deal to you. Because you want to you model that for your kids, that, that we love the Lord and we serve the Lord and, and we, we delight in doing it. It's not a have to, it's something we do because, because we love Him. 
It's a strong love with all your might. Your physical strength, your emotional strength, your intellectual strength. And this is so important for dads because here's, here's the bottom line. You cannot pass on to others what you do not possess. Here's the thing I cared more about with my kids than anything else. I wanted them to be passionate lovers of God. I told them, I don't care what you do. Uh, listen, I realize some are educators and it would probably you know, been awesome if my kids would have been Rhodes Scholars and gotten a free ride and all that. But honestly, that is not the priority for me. Because I've seen people who are that, but didn't love God. And I would tell my kids this, I don't care what you do vocationally. It doesn't matter to me. In fact, if they ever asked about the ministry, I would tell them, listen, you know what? The ministry is something that, man, you just better make sure God, don't let me call you. You better make sure God has called you. And don't get the idea that every church is like James River because frankly, you're growing up in the Disney world of churches. It's not like this very many places in the world. This is like the happiest place on earth. But uh, this, you know, so the ministry could be an invitation to a really hard life. So just let's get that square. And I don't, that's not a concern to me. What is a concern to me is that you love God with all your heart because if you don't, nothing else matters. And you'll know a lot of heartache. Sometimes I think as parents and especially as dads, either you see fathers living vicariously through their children or you see things that we may know and we may feel that we would say, well, that'd be a great profession or this would be a great profession or we're pushing our kids toward things that they may or may not be interested in. But more than anything, we just need to make sure we're pushing them towards a love for God. Here's how it played with our kids. Uh, we've, We've done private school, we've done public school, we've done home school. So when our, when David and Brandon were headed into 10th grade in their freshman year, they wanted to go to the public school system, which we were like, hey, that's great, but let me tell you how this rolls. You have to love God passionately, and the day I don't see that happening, you're coming home. Because that tells me you're not ready yet. Now, I'm not saying you have, see, we had a long history of relationship that allowed us to say that, but I'm telling you, that's where we were at. It's all that mattered to me. Not because I was the pastor of James River, but because having watched life, I know that's really all that matters. That when a person loves God, everything else sorts itself out. If they don't love God, then problems abound at every turn. Well, number three, A godly father lives with spiritual intentionality. Look at it in verse six. And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. The NIV says, impress them on your children. Here's what it's saying is, as a parent, and specifically as a dad, you and I have a responsibility to impress on our children, to make an imprint on the mind of our children the commands of the Lord. If you want your kids to be blessed, they have to understand those commands. They have to learn to process life intuitively and automatically through a paradigm of the Word of God. You say, well, how do we do that, John? That's easy for you because you're a preacher. And I would say this, certainly a preacher should have a leg up on that. But it doesn't say, now, to the Levites and the priests, this is what they need to be thinking, but the rest of you don't worry about it. No, God God says this can be done, and I want to suggest, and as we walk through this, ways that you can do this. First of all, we do it convictionally. It's got to be a conviction to you that it's important, otherwise it won't get done. We do in our life what we think is important. We talk about what we feel strongly about. We live out of our convictions. Our convictions determine our decisions in life. Look at what the scripture says. And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. If it's not on your heart, it will have very, you'll have very little impact on their heart. 
So it's got to be in you. The very first thing you and I have to do is to get the Word of God in our heart. The things you want to teach your children have to be real to you first because you can't teach what you don't know and you won't teach well what you don't feel passionately about. To that end, you need to know the Word of God. You need to be convinced about its importance. Have the commands of God in your heart so that it becomes a conviction so that you say, this is really important. Second, you have to be consistent. I mean, what, what I'm talking about here is whatever the, whatever the church, and praise God for an incredible early childhood program that's not just babysitting your kids, it's discipling your kids. Praise God for an elementary program that kids still today love to come back. I meet parents every, almost every week who say, you know, How'd you end up coming to James River? Well, you know, our kids just kept wanting to go back. We were like going to try other, but our kids are like, no, we want to go over there. You know, that's awesome. That's how it was when we first came. We didn't have a building. We didn't have any of the bells and whistles, but my kids wanted to be at church. And the reason why is because there were people like many of the people sitting in this room who loved God, who cared for kids and were happy to have the opportunity to disciple them. That's what's happening in our elementary area and our youth program. My kids learned much about prayer. They learned a lot about standing up for the Lord in the youth program. But the fact of the matter is, as good as those programs are and as capable as the leadership is, as a parent, we err if we see the church and its programs as anything more than supplemental. The job of the church is simply to support you in raising godly children. It's not the job of the church is to be supported by you in raising your godly children. So your job is to say, hey, I got to do it in the home. I've got I've to make it happen in the home. Watch this. You shall teach them diligently to your children. That means you teach it over and over again. It's not like, well, I told you once. So you talk about it, you repeat it, you reinforce it, you're daily talking about the things you want your children to know. You say, well now, how do I do that? How do I, how do I make that happen? It's the third thing, you do it conversationally. Look at it in, because the Bible tells us how to do this. You shall teach them diligently to your children. You say, well, how do I do that? You shall talk about them when you sit in your house when you walk by the way, when you lie down, and when you rise. You're going you're to talk about it all the time. Now, that doesn't mean, so let's not be weird here, okay? That doesn't mean like your kids come home from school. Hi, Dad, how's it going? Psalm 23, verse 1, the Lord is... <laughs> you know, let's, let's leave a little room for life and being relational, but every day what you're doing is you're, you're steering the conversation to spiritual outcomes. So when they're telling you about their day or you're talking to them or you're watching something and when they're younger, it's easier to do as they get older, you have to be a little more deaf, but if, you, but if you've, uh, and that was deft, not deaf. Um, <laughs> however, when you're parenting teenagers, deafness can be handy. Um, <laughs> Okay, I don't even know where I was now. So what you're doing is you're steering the conversation so that you're giving, you're giving godly outcomes. So you talk, you, they're telling you a story saying, well, what do you think is going to happen there? How do you think that will play out long term? You know, they keep doing that. What do you think is going to happen? What do you, what do you think? Does the Bible say anything about that? It's a good question. Ask your kids, does the Bible say anything about that? Talk about what the Bible would say about that. So you're talking to your kids. And when your kids ask something, you have an answer. You say, well, John, you know, that's, that is, I, I don't know the Bible well enough. Listen, we live in a wonderful day unlike any day in, in history where we have a thing called Google. So here's, seriously, because I think a lot of parents aren't really aware of this. 
I mean, I mean, I'm getting my whole sermon. No. <laughs> the way it works is your child says, what about this? You're like, man, I don't even know about this. So you go to a website called Got Questions, or there's a couple others. I don't know whether it's Bible.org, but there's, there's some. You can look online. You just ask biblical question X, and then put the, put the question out there. And you say, well, that's a great question. Let's look this up. Yeah. You know, I don't know the answer, but I'm interested in knowing. You know, there's something about that humility. There's something about that desire. There's something about you showing your... Ch and then you say, oh, there's another website. Let's see what that one is. Let's see what it says. And you begin to go through and you begin to look at what those websites say. You begin to read because there's some very good conservative ones. If, you, if you're not sure which ones, you, you can... Uh, uh, we'll, we'll attach to the notes section of this message uh, in, in a couple of days some websites you can go to that can help you because I'd want you to have that. You're looking for answers. I mean, in Deuteronomy 6 and verse 20, it says, when your son asks you in time to come, what is the meaning of the testimonies and the statues? In other words, the idea is that there's this conversational interaction with your children. Where you're talking about life, you're talking about issues, you're talking about circumstances. The issue is this, you have to talk. So one thing I think a lot of parents, if they're not careful, they think a conversation in passing is the same as the talking of relationship, and it's not. You have to spend time with your kids. You, you know, parents at times, unfortunately, make time or have time to park in front of the TV or to do whatever it is they want to do hobby-wise, but they're not spending time with their kids. And dad's there in a big way when, when, when they think that somehow they'll wait until the child is a certain age before they'll interact relationally with that child. Listen, dads, when your kids are little, they're looking up to you. They want to be with you. And what you want to do is you want to capitalize on that by building relationship with your children. Because when you build it and start young and watch it grow, and yes, it's hard, and yes, it's exhausting, and yes, it's not maybe as fulfilling, very cute, <laughs> and you have some funny stories, but it can, be, it can be taxing, but you're investing now, you're creating that dialogue, that interaction that's gonna draw dividends down the line. So good, Pastor, yeah. I mean, it's interesting, in the Proverbs over and over again, it says, my son, listen to my words. But in order for them to listen to the words, you have to be speaking the words, and there has to be the relationship that allows them to receive the words. And that's an investment over time. You have to talk to your children and you have to make time to talk to your children. So what I would do when, when my children were, for example, let's say, because it's different at every stage. So you've got when they're little and you're just taking them, you're just hauling them around with you. It's very easy to plant in those impressionable little minds thoughts of how awesome God is and how big God is and how strong. Who's stronger, God or Batman? Well, you know, that's a really good question, but I think God could take Batman with, you know, both hands tied behind his back. You know, I mean, it's, it's that kind of thing, but kids like that. And then as they move into elementary, what I would do is I would have this weekly appointment with them and I would take them to breakfast at Village Inn. And I would go and we'd sit there and, and we would play games and our game was dots. We'd have little hundred dots in the square and connect them and, and you know, I would let them win some of the time, but you know, <laughs> we'd play and I'd talk to them and I'd ask them questions. And we'd talk about why they didn't feel they had any friends. I'd talk to them about how valuable they are and about what I saw in them. And we talk about fun things and we talk about serious things, but all of it set it up for that moment when I pulled up to the school and I was letting them out and I could turn to them and I could say to each one of them something that I felt was important. David, remember, be a giant killer. Brandon, remember to live for God, be a beacon for God, be a lighthouse for God. Savannah, the hand of the Lord is on you in a unique way. Live for God and don't ever be embarrassed of who you are.
You know, those are, those are important things a parent gives to a child as they're going into battle. But if you're just tossing those things out, and I'm, I'm saying, hey, anything's better than nothing, but how much better to have the foundation of relationship? And then as your kids get older, it changes. I don't think I need to tell parents of teenagers this, but your parents don't, your, your teenager doesn't want to go to breakfast with you at Village Inn right before they go to school. They're not interested. They don't want to get up, number one. They may not want to be seen with you, number two. You know, all the cool kids are at the other table and you're sitting there with your parents, wow. You know, so you got to think about that. So I found that it, the best time to talk with the kids was at night. That's when teenagers, and you say, well, I got to get up early. You know what? For this season of your life, you're going to do with a little less sleep. Because usually about an hour after you wish you were asleep, when your eyelids start to close, their mouth starts to open. And you have to be present to win. You have to be there. You have to hear what they're saying. You have to lay on the bed. I'd lay on the boy's bed and say, what, what's going on? And just let them talk. Or Debbie would say, and invariably in any, any the value of, of a traditional family, one of the values is usually one's a little more relationally sensitive and savvy. So in our case, it was Debbie. So Debbie would say to me, she'd say, so and so struggling. I was, I'd, I'd be like, really? And she'd be like, yeah, struggling with this. And um, you need to go talk to him. And I'd be like, okay, I'll, I'll, do, I'll go do it. You know, so my, my MO is to charge right in and say, here, you're struggling with something. Let's talk, you know. <laughs> and Debbie would do this. She'd say, now listen. Here's what I would do if I were you. And she would, she would game plan the conversation. And I would follow her game plan because she was right. And I would go in there and do exactly what she said to set the stage and control my cut to the chase type of, of personality, and it was good. I'm just simply saying whatever you have to do to have a relationship with your kids where you can talk deep, you can talk often, and you can talk about the Lord. Listen, can I just say this? Parents, you got to teach your kids to talk. You have to teach your kids to talk. I mean, because what happens is somewhere, somewhere after junior high, they go into the stage where full sentences are lost on them. I don't know. Hey, if you're a teenager, I'm trying to defend you, but, um, and not everybody's in this boat. I'm just saying our kids are pretty normal. And they come into the kitchen and, you know, Debbie would ask them a question and, you know, they'd kind of grunt at her like an Iowa hog, you know, and... <laughs> I'd say, I would pull them aside, generally. <laughs> I'd say, hey, you know, that's not the way you talk to your mother. She deserves full sentences. She's not your maid, she's your mom. So I need you to go back in there, and if she wants a conversation, you need to give it to her. It's right, it's respectful, and she doesn't ask anything of you. But you need full sentences. You know, that's a subject, a verb, an object. <laughs> it's a good, good, good opportunity to refresh their memory on grammar. Um, anyway, you do those things. Notice it says this. When you sit in your house, when you walk, when you lie down, when you rise. When you sit in your house, so you're sitting at the dinner table or you're sitting in the, the family room, when you're, when you're together, you're going to talk about the Lord. You're going to think, and you're the one who gener generates it. You're the one who says, hey, you know, I was reading this in my Bible. Or, hey, I saw this on the news. Or, you know, I, I saw that uh, we were coming home, and there was, there was somebody that looked like they had an accident, and my heart just went out to them. I was praying for them. I wonder how they're doing. You start talking. When you walk by the way... So when you're, when you're driving down the road, 
you know, as you're, as you're going, you know, and I mean, when you're honestly, as a parent, when, when they're in those, those busy years before they get their driver's license, I mean, you feel like you're a taxi, but that's the time to, when you walk, that's what that's talking about, your taxi time, that you're, you're talking about the Lord, that you're, you're thinking about the Lord, that you're, you know, there were times we would play some of their music and talk about it. Let's talk about that. Let's get the lyric sheet out and read it. What do you think? How's, how's that work? Garbage in, garbage out. I mean, that's a time to talk. To talk about godly principles. When you lie down, so when they're getting ready to lay down, especially, I mean, as we talked about a teenager, or when they get up, when you rise up, you're, you're, you're talking, you're, you're mentioning the Lord to them. I, I, and I won't sing it to you. I sang it in the first service. I had a little song I would sing to the kids when they'd get up. I sang it till, clear till they left home. It's maybe why they all left home so early in life. <laughs> I mean, what you're doing is you're relating to them. Finally, you do it conspicuously. I mean, notice it says this. Tie them as symbols on your hands, bind them on your foreheads, write them on the door frames of your houses and your gates. So even today, in, in the Judaism of today, we were at the Wailing Wall, and there are phylacteries, little boxes, leather boxes that have scripture in them, and they'll tie them on their head, and then they'll wrap the, the band on their arm and tie them, and, and even some of those ultra-Orthodox who are reading the Word of God, they're not there for a bar mitzvah or anything. They just have it there as, as uh, obeying that law. What it's really saying, though, is tie them on your hands, bind them on your foreheads. It's saying, have the Word of God prevalent in what you think and on your hands prevalent in what you do. In other words, in all of life, you're thinking about it. Write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates. Let me ask you this. Is the Word of God conspicuous in your home? Are there things that point to it? Now, I mean, I'm not talking about, you know, getting paper and writing scriptures and completely wallpaper in your house and paper with scriptures on it. I've seen that and it's a little weird, but... <laughs> you know, I am talking about, though, certain things that speak to you. For example, if you were to go into my office here at the church and I've had it up for years, there's, I have two prints on the wall and they both involve Daniel. One is Daniel's answer to the king. And he's in the lion's den looking up at a shaft of light. And the other is Daniel in the den of lions. And the lions are cowering around him. But it's a reminder to me that sometimes as a pastor, you've gotta be bold enough to speak when people don't wanna hear it and to live for God when people don't want you to you know it's just part of it at home we have the blessing written on our on our entryway if you're to go in our entryway you, you're not going to miss it when you walk in our house part of it is we want people who come in to the house to read it and to think about it part of it is that when I it's such a part of our ministry here and when I read it, a couple things happen to me. First of all, I stop at times and I just look at it before I'm walking into my office and just read it. And though I've prayed for the church before, more times than I can count, I stop and pray again, Lord, wherever the people of James River are, and I read it and I just say it. Or I say, Lord, do that in my own life or in a situation that I'm facing. It's just a good reminder, but you know what? Conspicuous, maybe the best way to think of that is, is the Word of God, is the Bible out? Where it's, where it's visible, not because it's a decoration that you dust once a week, but because you just want the Bible handy where you can, where you can grab it, because you, you might have a question, you might have something come to your mind, you might be thinking about something and wonder where that is in the Bible, or you might have, somebody might ask you a question, say, you know what, I think the Bible, you want it where you can grab it, or because you just know every day you're gonna be reading in it. Dads, let your, let your kids see you read the Bible. Let them see you read it. As a pastor, you know, I never wanted my kids to have the idea that I only read the Bible to get a sermon. So I read, I read my Bible my daily devotion from a different Bible, from the one-year Bible, and it was, it was dog-eared and duct-taped. But my kids knew 
that's where dad reads to feed his soul. The other Bible is the Bible he reads to feed the people. It's important. But when you do that, you're gonna leave your kids a legacy. I'm just telling you dads, thank you for what you do, but if you're not doing some of these things, you need to ask the Lord to help you incorporate them in your life because it's about more than you, it's about the legacy you're gonna leave your kids. It's about you loving God from your heart and it's about you leading your kids to follow in your footstep. And when you do that, they're gonna be blessed, they're gonna prosper, they're gonna succeed, they're gonna know the hand of God on their life because the hand of God was on your life, amen.